Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good to be back. This is Phil Giotti here again, and this program is One in Messiah. And we're here live Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And we, the, the, the purpose of One in Messiah, I should restate, is, of course, connecting passages in the Tanakh and passages in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, to, pro, to kind of put scripture together and show, number one, how the whole plan of salvation unfolds through the whole scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And also, going back to uh, John chapter 5, 39, where Yeshua himself says that all the scripture testifies of him. It says, all the scriptures testify of me. He basically says all the scrolls are about me. And again, I like to emphasize that it doesn't mean some of the books are about him or a little bit of this one and a little bit of that one and a couple of verses here and a chapter over there. They're all about him because they all prefigure him. There are types through Torah, through the prophets, through the writings that tell us about Messiah, what he's going to be like, what he's going to do, and what the plan of salvation actually is. And um, I have a live version of one in Messiah, <laughs> like an in-person version, and that also gets streamed on um, Facebook and on my YouTube channel. <clears throat> the YouTube channel is One in Messiah Gift of Grace Ministries. One in Messiah, Gift of Grace Ministries. And if you go to that YouTube channel, and please do and subscribe, then all the Friday night teachings will be there, as well as some other things that I put together, as well as the programs from um, Messianic Lamb Network. Then there's also a, a podcast. So if you go to your favorite podcast app, and I think it's on all the podcast apps, if you go and search for Dr. Phil slash Gift of Grace, one in, Dr. Phil slash Gift of Grace, you'll go to the podcast and there's, <clears throat> I think, 800 and some there now. Maybe there's 900 by now. I don't know. Because they've been going on for, I think, about eight or nine years. So you can check that out, too. There's also two websites. There's www.oneinmessiah.website. That's oneinmessiah.website. Yeah, the suffix actually is website. And that site has um, Bible teachings on it. It has the audio of all of the um, One in Messiah live ministries going back to our first one, which was in April of... 2016. And then there's another website that's www.giftofgraceministries.org, giftofgraceministries.org, and that has uh, my radio shows on it going back to 2009, as well as Bible studies and teachings and miscellaneous things, some pictures of our um, ministry in Israel that we do in Messianic congregations in Galilee and a lot of interesting things that we do here in the Cleveland area. So just a little advertisement if you want to check any of that out. And as I mentioned the last couple of weeks, um, we this, this program has basically been teachings in kind of a I don't know, maybe too formal way. But coming up in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start interspersing some uh, interviews. <clears throat> the first one maybe next Thursday, but I won't tell you who it is because as we go along, we're going to uh, hopefully get to speak with and interact with um, some of the leading people in the worldwide messianic movement. So stay tuned for that. I'll give you um, information. 
Um, so today, however, we're going to go back to doing kind of the usual format, which is a teaching. <laughs> and, um, oh, I should, I should mention that when, um, one and Messiah began about six, you know, not quite six and a half years ago. It is based on a scripture passage, which is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. You can read that for your homework. But um, the essence of it is that Yeshua in his flesh broke down the partition between the two, making of them one new man. So I have to emphasize, and this is particularly important to me because there's so many divisions now in the body, the body of Messiah, the body of Christ, so many divisions, and I don't have to tell any of, of you that because there's, I don't know how many tens of thousands of denominations, <clears throat> and then there's many messianic congregations that are referred to as congregations and then there's the the places referred to as the gentile churches and this is really all kind of mind-boggling and silly because the body is not divided you know in first corinthians um chapter one paul talks about you can go back i just did a teaching on this you can go back to that um gift of grace website and listen to this and it'll be on the podcast probably in the next day or two but in first corinthians chapter one paul talks about there's divisions there in the church in corinth and there's people saying i'm of paul i'm of apollos i'm of kephas i'm of uh, i'm of christ and he's and he adds paul adds is christ divided were you baptized in the name of paul so he says there shouldn't be divisions there's, there's not a Jewish body and a Gentile body. And we're going to see today kind of the groundwork of how that happens. Then we're going to add some passages from the Tanakh over the next couple of weeks that kind of set the stage and set the foundation for that. Because it's important to keep in mind, see, if you're a... If you're a Gentile believer who's been, who's grown up in the last part of the 20th century and so far in the 21st century, and you're a believer and you go to church, and it's not a big deal to you that Gentiles are included in the kingdom because that's normal. But as we're going to see tonight, this was really a big deal. Even Paul, even Saul of Tarsus, the, the former Pharisee, thought this was a big deal. We're going to take up a passage from um, Ephesians, a different passage from Ephesians. Um, he thought this was one of the great mysteries of all time. The Gentiles were going to be included in the body of Messiah. We're going to be included in the kingdom. <clears throat> now, why was that all so weird when it seems so normal to us? Well, we have to go back to the book of Genesis, and I'm not going to spend, you know, the rest of the time on this because you got, you all, all know this anyway, but there comes a time in the book of Genesis where Abram is called, and Abram becomes the father of the people, and... God makes promises to Abram. Now he's living in the land of the Chaldeans, you know, present day Iraq. He's 75 years old. When God starts speaking to him, he's not some young 20 year old who's going to start a big family, but God promises him land, promises him, promises him descendants. And those, those things are all well and good. And we see his descendants. He's the father of the Jews and the father of the Arabs. We see the land of Israel, Eretz Israel, which is the land promised to him. And 
<coughs> Those two things are all well and good. But the third promise is, I think, the most powerful because it applies to us. I The land that was promised is not mine because I'm not a physical descendant of Abraham. But Paul, Saul, I'm going to call him Paul to eliminate confusion because, you know, when you call people by different names, somebody who's not familiar with all that says, who's he talking about? Who's Saul? Is he talking about King Saul? So Paul, St. Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, he did not change his name. He had two names. But in the book of Acts, he's then, after chapter 9, he's referred to as Paul. And so he was, of course, a Pharisee, was zealous for the law. He said no one was more zealous for the law than he was, he tells us in Galatians. He says no one was advancing in Judaism more than he was. I mean, he was... He was the star. He studied, studied under Gamaliel, the premier rabbi of the time. And he's mentioned in the book of Acts as well, in chapter uh, 5. Or is it 4? No, I think it's 5. But anyway, he's mentioned in the book of Acts because Gamaliel was very, very famous. And Paul was probably his star pupil. And this incredible zeal for the law, and this incredible zeal for the covenant that was given to Moses, that resided in him and that led him to persecute the early believers, then, on the road to Damascus, a terrific change takes place where he becomes the apostle of grace, not the apostle of law. He becomes the apostle of grace, and he becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And so, just like we see how the new covenant comes from the older covenant, the life of Saul of Tarsus slash Paul, the life of Paul, illustrates this in a physical way in one man's life. And it's really quite remarkable that it he's a, a physical representation of this, of this change of covenant. <clears throat> and so, starting with Abram, the last promise that I don't think I got to was that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. 75-year-old man who was living in Iraq. All the nations of the earth, all the communities of the earth would be blessed through him. So that means that in the year 2022, I am sitting in Cleveland, Ohio, and I'm in a community, I'm in a nation, and somehow Abraham becomes a blessing to me living here, however long it is, 4,000 years later. And on its surface, it sounds ridiculous. You know, it's kind of like when, when Paul talks about the message of the cross as foolishness to those that are perishing. He says, the foolishness of our preaching brings people to salvation. The foolishness of our preaching. Now, Paul certainly was not a fool. He was highly educated. He was brilliantly intelligent, knew many languages, had studied from the time of his bar mitzvah till the road to Damascus. We don't know exactly how long that was, but it was a long period of time. Knew the scriptures backwards and forwards had probably read every rabbinic commentary and and learned at the feet of Gamaliel and, and the others. So he knew the promises to Abraham, of course, <clears throat> and we don't know if how they thought 
that Abraham was going to be a blessing to the communities of the earth, to the nations of the earth. But now we know that he is that, because why? Because Yeshua is his descendant. So from Abraham comes Messiah, eventually, through Isaac, through Jacob, through Judah, down to David. You can follow the genealogies in Matthew and Luke. And if you want to memorize it, that's great. <laughs> if you don't want to memorize it, that's great. But the important thing is the genealogies are there for a very important reason, because it shows the connection the physical connection of Messiah Yeshua to the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of course. But even, I don't want to say more importantly, but maybe as important, his connection to David. So that the prophecies made in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel 7, chapter 7 can come true, that God tells David through the prophet Nathan that from his body is going to become is going to come Messiah. He's going to come the one who's going to shepherd Israel from his body. Which of course is why one of the main messianic titles is son of David. So starting with Abram, Abraham, Abraham, we have the formation of the chosen people. They're called Israel because Jacob's name was changed to Israel after he wrestled with the Lord. And Israel basically means I've wrestled with the Lord or I've struggled with the Lord <clears throat> or I've been fighting with the Lord. And, you know, as, um, well, even in the, even in the, um, even in the, um, series The Chosen, Yeshua says to um, to Nathaniel, to the character who plays Nathaniel, that um, Israel, Jacob, was a deceiver. And the people were formed on somebody who was quite a deceiver. He deceived everyone. Deceived his father, deceived his brother, deceived his father-in-law. But the important thing is the people rose from this as an identifiable group of people that are still an identifiable group, identifiable group of people today, after however many years it is, 4,000 years, I, I, I don't know. But the chosen people were chosen for two very important reasons. One reason is, of course, that God revealed himself through the scripture that he gave to the Israelites. They were a special people. They were his own people. He was to be their inheritance. They were separate from the rest of the people. They were not to be like the other people. They always wanted to be like the other people, but they weren't supposed to be like the other people. They were supposed to be separate, just like believers in Yeshua today are supposed to be separate. We're not supposed to be striving to be like everybody else. We're not supposed to be working hard to be like the world. We're not supposed to be watering down our beliefs, watering down everything that we know from our faith in Yeshua and from the 4,000 years of Judeo-Christian scripture that we're not supposed to be giving that up so that the world likes us better, so that we can seem to be like everybody else, because we are to be separate, like the Israelites were to be separate. When they went into the land, they were not to do business with the people there, not marry the people there not hang out with the people there. When one of the Israelite men brought a Moabite girlfriend to the to the sanctuary, a plague broke out, and I think 24,000 people died. This was serious business. 
And God says, these people will contaminate you. And of course, they did. And there was idolatry and there was all kinds of mess because these people contaminated the chosen people. But God reveals himself in the Torah. Okay? In Torah, he reveals himself. His nature, how he expects you to be holy, what the standards are for holiness, is all given in Torah. <clears throat> and they were the only people that had the covenant. They were the only people that had the Torah. As the prophets came along, the prophets expanded on that. They had messages for the people. They talked about Messiah and his coming and what salvation was going to be like and what was going to happen. Even what was going to happen at the end of days, which we're in now. So God reveals himself to this group of people, not to everyone. So there was a group of people that were his people that he revealed himself to. And of course, number two, and more important, is the fact that Messiah has a human nature. He is human. He's the God-man. He's 100% God and he's 100% man. So the human part of him has to come from humanity. And so his heredity, and again, I, you can read the you can read the uh, genealogies if if you like; they're interesting. Uh, but his heredity, his biological self, comes from Abraham, comes from the patriarch, comes from David. And so you need a group of people to provide, that's not really a good word, to provide the humanity, the human nature of the Messiah. Because if he's not the God-man, he can't be the Messiah. So we'll talk about that some other time. But so all of this to say that as time went on, the chosen people, the Israelites, worshipped, did the sacrifices, had the uh, the Tanakh develop over time, right up until about 400 B.C. with Malachi, the last recognized prophet. And they knew, although there was a lot of rebellion, and you know we'll talk about that some other time, but they knew that they were the chosen people, that God had chosen them above all the people. And if you go to, <coughs> I'm sure most of you that watch this channel, have been to Messianic congregations, Messianic synagogues, or whatever you like to call them, and maybe even traditional synagogues, in other words, traditional Jews who do not believe in Yeshua as Messiah, and you know the prayers that are recited before the Torah reading. But of all the people of the earth, you gave us the Torah. You gave it to Israel. You gave it, didn't give it to anybody else. Blessed are you, giver of the Torah. You gave it to us. Well, not me. I'm a Gentile. But you gave, you, see, you gave it to us. You didn't give it to anybody else. It was very unique. It was a unique group of people that had all that divine revelation. And so you can see that as they waited for Messiah, as the prophets wrote, as they, as they sang and read through, but mostly they would have sung the Psalms. There's many of the Psalms that are messianic. David himself would have known the promise that Messiah was going to come from him. And people would have immediately picked up on the fact that Messiah is going to be the son of David. He's going to sit on his throne. When the angel Gabriel speaks to the Virgin Mary, he's pretty clear. He doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't give her a whole lot of theological facts. He doesn't expect her to know every scripture that's been written in the Tanakh. 
he says that this son that's going to be conceived in you is going to sit on the throne of his father, David. And he's going to sit there forever. The throne is going to last forever. He basically repeats the prophecy that's in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And then Gabriel adds, you're going to name him Yeshua, which means salvation. So his name, capital N, is very important because it underscores what he's going to do. Joseph, Mary's husband, has a dream about this. You know, Joseph doesn't say anything in the scriptures, but he has a couple of cool dreams, <clears throat> at least, maybe three cool dreams. But, you know, he has a dream where an angel says to him, you're going to name this boy Yeshua because he's going to deliver his people from their sins. Deliver people from their sins. I mean, this is no beating around the bush. No kind of vague concepts about what's Messiah here for. He didn't come to teach us about recycling. It's great to recycle. It's great. You should be a good steward of the environment. He didn't come to make our lives somehow better. He didn't come to supplement our existence. He didn't come to give us something more to do on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning. He didn't come to give us kind of an edge on living our lives. He came to save us. And so Gabriel tells Mary this, the angel in Joseph's dream tells him that. And all this to say that as all this time went by, the Israelites were very confident that Messiah was going to be for them. And as, as time went on, the thinking became, because there are many references to Messiah being um, a warrior, a king, mighty in battle, portrayed with swords and armor and you know all kind of military imagery, <clears throat> it became kind of standard to think that when Messiah came, he was going to restore the kingdom of David and Solomon. He was going to make Israel preeminent again, powerful, militarily, economically, politically, and that the nations, the Gentiles, would say, wow, those Israelites have an awesome king. They have a very powerful kingdom, and wow, look how prosperous and mighty they are. So somebody went, somebody said recently, and I had seen it on Facebook, and I don't remember who sent it to me, but I've been thinking about it ever since. And the saying was, 2,000 years ago, the Jews expected a, a lion and got a lamb. In our day, the church is expecting a lamb, and they're going to get a lion. <laughs> so, the reason Paul calls this the great mystery is for this, for this reason, that the Israelites didn't really get the point, even though they read many, many passages from Isaiah and the half Torah reading in the synagogues, some references and other prophets like Zechariah and uh, many places, the Gentiles were going to be included. The Gentiles were going to come to worship the Messiah. The Messiah was going to be for them too. And Paul talks about this in terms of a great mystery. <clears throat> and we're going to go to, let me make this a little bigger. I think that makes it a little bigger. Anyway, we're going to go to Ephesians 3, 1 to 9. We're just going to read this and then just talk about it a little bit because, you know, it'll be, the time will go by really quick. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me, for you, 
how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly already written, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the, by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Paul writes very complex sentences. So let's take this apart a little bit. Oh, a little bit more here. To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This is a mystery to him. He says, this mystery has been made known to us now. The Gentiles are fellow heirs. I'm preaching to the Gentiles. I have the message for the Gentiles. <clears throat> this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. So, what is he saying here? Paul's saying he's appointed. He didn't take this on on his own. Saul of Tarsus did not leave for Damascus saying, yeah, I think along the road I'm going to meet the Messiah. Yeah, I think along the road something big is going to happen to me. I think along the road, my whole life is going to change. <clears throat> he did not. You know, the Acts chapter 9 points out that he left Jerusalem. He was still breathing murderous threats against the believers. Murderous threats. It wasn't a case of disagreement. It wasn't a case of, I'd like to sit and talk with these guys and try to understand this better. He had murderous thoughts, murderous threats. He was going to round up the believers in Damascus, bring them back to Jerusalem so that the high priest could try them. I mean, this was what was in his mind. So he did not appoint himself to this. You know, when we're called to witness, to evangelize, to preach, it's not our doing. If it's our doing, we shouldn't do it. If we decide to do it, we shouldn't do it. He knew this was not from him. As you see there, he says, I was appointed. He says, I was called by Yeshua himself. <clears throat> we know the story in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus. He talks to Yeshua personally. Has tremendous amount of revelation given to him over a three-day period of time. But he points out, He's called by Yeshua. This is not something that he is doing himself. And that his message is to go to the Gentiles. To the Gentiles of all people. Unclean, non-covenant, uncircumcised, no way of getting to know God or be pleasing to him or be reconciled in any way. But this message was to go to them. And he, the Pharisee, the ultimate Pharisee, pretty much, is taking a message to the Gentiles. It's pretty wild. And he talks about, you know, he's, we know he endures great difficulties. We know, you know, in Second Corinthians, he talks about being shipwrecked and being beaten and <clears throat> not having food and not having water and being cold and being hot and, you know, 
Now we don't want to do something if it's raining outside. But he lists all these things that he had to do. And he says he's a prisoner for Yeshua. He's a doulos. He's a bondservant. The Greek word doulos, it's a little more than a slave, but a lot less than a hired hand. It's a bond servant. There were people that went into service to somebody to work off debt or for other reasons, but the bond servant. And he says, I'm a bond servant to Yeshua. I was the Pharisee. I did all that stuff. I wore all the cool stuff. I knew all that stuff, but now I counted all as loss. Philippians 3. Counted all as loss. Because he says, now I'm a prisoner. I'm willing to endure these difficulties because I have a message for the Gentiles. For the Gentiles. The message is for them. It's a new dispensation for them. You know, Yeshua told the woman at the well, the Father wants worshipers in spirit and in truth. And the time is already here. And the time is already here where you don't just worship only at Jerusalem or only on Mount Gerizim. You can worship wherever you are. So this is a new dispensation for the Gentiles too, not just for the Israelites. And he emphasizes how this news is going to Gentiles and that this is his specific message, his specific mission. I should say. And he's very clear about that. I've been appointed to speak, to tell the Gentiles about these unsearchable riches. What are the unsearchable riches? Salvation. There is no more unsearchable richness than salvation. People don't think about that much anymore. When I was growing up, people worried were they going to go to heaven? Were they going to go to hell? Were they following God? Were they following his love? Now, as you know, the culture generally barely gives that a second thought. Because it's, again, like Paul said, it's foolishness to those that are perishing. The cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. All you have to do now is turn your TV on, and you can see what the reaction is to the message of salvation. But Paul points out this is a specific message for him, and he didn't make it up. He, as the Pharisee who was the most zealous for the law and progressing the most, he did not set out for Damascus thinking, I think I want to talk to Gentiles from now on. He says, this was made known to me by revelation made known to me by revelation. I didn't make this up. No person told me this. You know, he talks about that in 1 Corinthians as well. No man told me the gospel. I got direct revelation. Nobody came and witnessed to me when I was having coffee at Panera's. Nobody came and talked to me while I was eating lunch at Denny's. <clears throat> Nobody stopped me in the street and said, hey, do you know the Lord? said, no man told me the gospel. I got it by revelation. And part of that revelation was that this great mystery of all the ages was made known to Paul. Great mystery of all the ages was made known. Now, he's talking about all the ages from the time of the patriarchs. Now, Saul of Tarsus would have known passages in the book of Isaiah, which clearly say that Gentiles, that the nations will come into the kingdom. But he says this is a mystery that's been just made known now. It wasn't clear before. And this is the knowledge of Messiah. This is what's important, the knowledge of Messiah that this is a wealth of revelation that he got, which everything he knew up to that point was building up to this. 
everything that's written in Torah, everything that's written in the prophets, everything that's written in the writings, is building up to Messiah, is the foundation for Messiah, for salvation. It's the foundation of all that. <clears throat> there are prefigurements, there's types. We're not going to get into that again, but you know, when you think about it, blood atonement is the biggest one. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Blood atonement is the whole Torah. So there's this wealth of revelation in this huge change comes for Saul slash Paul. <laughs> now he understands this mystery. All the stuff he read was to prepare him for this. And what was he being prepared for? To take a specific mission to Gentile people. To Gentile people. So he says this wasn't known in past ages. Well, of course, it was known by, by Hashem. It was known by God, of course. But people didn't realize the implications of this, didn't realize the, the extent of this, the depth of it. And he says, now it's been revealed, how? By the Holy Spirit to the apostles. It's revealed now directly to the apostles, <coughs> including him. It was revealed to him during those, the time on the road, the time in Damascus, in the house on the street called Straight. <laughs> I love that. But anyway, it was revealed to him as well as to the other apostles. This great mystery. You know, it took Peter quite a while to get this. It took him... Paul got this almost immediately, pretty much immediately. Peter and some of the others, you know, you read through Acts and you see this kind of weird Peter kind of bouncing back and forth. Paul being in his face at Antioch as he's insulting Gentile believers. You know, people calling him in saying, how come you went to the house of a Gentile? Oh, well, you know, I took some people with me. I didn't go by myself. Wishy-washy. Then finally says, oh, well, they got the Spirit the same way we got it at the beginning. So I had to baptize them. So it takes Peter, Kephas, a while. He gets it, of course, and he also preaches to many Gentiles. But Paul gets this almost immediately. All the other apostles went to Gentile areas. You know, we don't know exactly, but, you know, Mark went to Egypt, certainly, and founded the church in Alexandria. And if you're familiar with the Coptic Orthodox Christians, their churches are pretty much all named St. Mark if they're out of, the, out of Egypt. We have a couple of beautiful Coptic churches near us here um, because they they credit Mark with planting their church, just like Paul started the churches in Greece. <clears throat> you know, um, Thaddeus and um, Nathaniel went to Armenia and were martyred there. Armenia became the first nation to accept Christianity as a national religion. They were martyred there, Gentile areas. There were no Jews living there. So the Spirit makes known to all of these evangelists that Gentiles have to be evangelized as well, that this mission is for them. This salvation narrative applies to them, not just the descendants of Abraham. And I think it's really cool in, also in Romans, I can't think of the exact, it might be in chapter 2 or it might be in chapter 3. I can't remember now. But anyway, Paul references the point that just because you're physical, Abraham, you're physically related to Abraham, that's great, but that doesn't guarantee you anything. You know, the people always used, oh, we're children of Abraham, as a defense, to John the Baptist and also to Yeshua. Oh, we're sure of Abraham. 
John the Baptist, Yochanan, tells them God can raise children to Abraham out of these rocks if he wants to. In other words, it's great that you're related to Abraham, but we as Gentiles, we're related to spiritual Abraham because we're doing the true Abrahamic things if you're a believer. We're doing the true blessing that came from Abraham. Not related to him. We're not descended from Abraham. But we're spiritual Abraham. Abraham's our father in faith. And so Paul points out, he asks the question, what is this great mystery? And it's that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Big mystery. It's not a mystery to us because we know this. But at the time, it was huge. Remember in the book of Acts when uh, Peter and John find out that they're Samaritans that are accepting Yeshua. They say, we better go up there and see what's going on. I mean, what Samaritans? Uh, we better go up there. When, when Saul of Tarsus is struck blind on the road to Damascus and he's sitting in the house <clears throat> and Ananias is sent to heal him. Very interesting passage in Acts 9. You should definitely read that for your homework. You know, the Lord tells Ananias that Paul is his vessel to the Gentiles. Vessel to the Gentiles. Specifically, his mission is to preach to the Gentiles. Great mystery. He calls it a great mystery, but his mission was to preach to the Gentiles. Pretty remarkable. So, he calls it a great mystery. The Ananias has to tell Paul, Saul, that he's going to endure difficulties, He's going to be a chosen vessel to the Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas have hands laid on them in Jerusalem. They're set apart for a specific mission. And it's a specific mission to the Gentiles, as he points out here in Ephesians. So, Gentiles are going to be, are, in fact, fellow heirs. <clears throat> They're not second-class believers. They're not second-class believers. It's not like the days where you had true Israel worshiping the God of Israel and the Gentile that came into your land was worshiping Saturn or Apollo and did all those little things with all kind of idols and weird stuff. Gentiles are fellow heirs of the same body. And the purpose of this ministry, one to Messiah, is that Yeshua himself brings the, together the two, making one new man. Making one new man. So he says they're fellow heirs. They're not second class citizens, they have the same promise. When the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius' household in Acts 10, they're a bunch of Romans. They apparently had faith in the God of Israel. They were God-fearers. They were righteous Gentiles. <clears throat> you know, all these names that applied. But the Holy Spirit fell on them while Peter was preaching. When he goes back to Jerusalem to answer the criticisms against him that he went to a Gentile house, he tells his Jewish colleagues that those Gentiles received the Spirit the same way that they had. It was the same Spirit, and he came in the same way, and he gave them the same gifts. And everything was just like it had happened with them. So they are not second-class believers. In, in Galatians, Paul takes great pains to talk about the Judaizers perverting the gospel. We have Judaizers today of all kinds. 
So Paul says the gospel's pure and simple, and you have to keep it pure and simple. And Gentiles have the same promise. And this was not fully revealed before. There were indications, more than indications. There was, like I say, mostly in Isaiah. There were prophecies, but it was not fully revealed because everything is done at an appointed time. You know, if you read the scroll of Isaiah, say, in, I don't know, 500 B.C., and you see these passages about the Goyim and <clears throat> coming and I'm calling them, and you say, well, I don't know what that means. But now, when you get to this appointed time, God does everything in appointed, at appointed times. The feast days are appointed times. Things happen at appointed times. Moadim, appointed times. This is revealed now at a time immediately after Messiah, immediately after the cross, immediately after Pentecost, that the Gentiles are now co-heirs. Co-heirs, not second-class heirs. They're not the stepchild. In Romans 8, Paul says that we're given a spirit of adoption, not a spirit of bondage, so that we cry out, Abba, Father. <clears throat> he doesn't say, if you're a Jewish believer, you can cry out, Abba, Father, that's great. If you're a Gentile believer, well, you know, you got to watch what you say. No, he's saying that to the whole body, because the Gentiles are not stepchildren. They are, they are co-heirs, and at the appointed time, this was revealed in a way that was never revealed before. Hadn't been revealed completely because it's all done through the Messiah. Because the plan of salvation is applicable to everybody. People aren't saved in different ways. There's many people that say, well, the Jews don't have to be evangelized because they have their own covenant. No. Salvation is one plan, is one covenant. It goes as a whole panorama through the scripture. There's not different salvations for different groups. And it's all done through the Messiah. And Paul understood this. He understood now that the Gentiles are called to salvation. This was revealed to him. And he says it's through faith. He doesn't tell them to start to start keeping the law of Moses. He doesn't say, here's the Torah, start studying, and then we're going to have a review session about the 613 laws, and then we're going to make sure you guys got this down. <clears throat> he says it's through faith. And that's how Gentiles are going to be co-heirs. Not through the law of Moses, but through faith. And it's the same plan for everybody. Same plan for everybody. Fellow heirs, co-heirs. You know, he talks about this in Romans. He talks about this in Galatians. Adopted. Abba. Not second-class citizens. So he's called to be a minister of this. And he said it's a gift of grace. He didn't say, I got this job because I was so awesome. And I, he doesn't say, I got this job because I knew so much about the law that all those other guys in the temple, man, they would ask me any question because they knew I was the one who was awesome. He says, no, this was a gift, and it was a gift of grace. It wasn't something that I had earned somehow. But I'm a minister of this now because I'm explaining grace to these non-covenant formally unclean people. And this would be completely unexpected by most people who are Israelites, including Saul of Tarsus, the ultimate Pharisee. Pharisee of Pharisee, Hebrew of Hebrews. <clears throat> From the tribe of Benjamin. You know, you know, you know all that. But he gives, a, gives all his credentials. 
And he says, all that is lost now compared to knowing Christ. It's rubbish. It's manure. It's skabula compared to knowing Christ. So this was completely unexpected that he was going to get this mission because this was totally God's power and it was a gift of grace. It was a grace that was poured out on Saul on his way. And it says he's going to preach the unsearchable riches of Messiah to the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. Unsearchable riches. And he says he's the least of the saints. You know, after he was called, he realized he had been persecuting the church. He said, I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. But I'm here. I'm here with the message. I only talk about Christ and Christ crucified. I only want to know about Christ and Christ crucified. And now my mission is to tell this to the Gentiles. It's unsearchable riches because it's mercy and grace. It isn't built on how well you do with the law. Because guess what? You're not going to do well with the law. But it's freedom. It's a message because of love. This plan unfolds. And Gentiles now come into the covenant. And they become part of the bride of Messiah. And as Paul says, God's reconciling the world through Messiah. So, wow, that was the great mystery. And as usual, I'm over time. But anyway, um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've, um, you know, you might go back to my YouTube channel and watch it again. And I'll be back again next time. Um, where I think next week we're probably going to have an interview. So stay tuned.